Hi everybody, trying to get my way around it and I uh, hope I am panning out just well. Uh, my name is Rufai and this is Rufai's Roundup. And what do I do every time on Rufai's Roundup? I give in-depth analysis on political happenings in Nigeria and probably some other parts of the world. So this is an extended form of analysis. Uh, get well to share the video and ensure that we get some good push on our YouTube platform. I apologize, uh, camera is a little bit shaking, I'm still doing everything, but uh, I'll get a crew together uh, for this at some point. All right, today on uh, Refresh Roundup, we've got three main stories, and those three main stories are going to snowball into many things and analysis. Uh, the very first story uh, is the National Assembly yesterday, uh, or day before yesterday, uh, declaring a state of emergency as regards ritual killings in the country. And I was really happy that the National Assembly uh, was talking about topical issues. But I was also shocked at the same time about the hypocrisy of the National Assembly. Our politicians and political class are big hypocrites. And they don't look inwards. You know, we've had a lot of shenanigans going in the National Assembly, but I'll tell it to them, to their faces, they're big hypocrites. When you look at the genesis of ritual killing, yes, you will say to a large extent, you know, it's caused because of many factors, which I might not be able to pinpoint. But one major factor that has also propelled ritual killings in recent time is the urge and the get rich quick scheme that is propagated on social media by some of the influencers that this some National Assembly members use and they are friendly with, and a general societal decay. And I say general societal decay because once you go to social media space in Nigeria, all you see is abuses, curses, and all of that. So there's a general societal decay going on, and some of these are propagated by some members that are probably being in the National Assembly and our political class, and they show off so much wealth, which you can't explain. I mean, how can you explain somebody that had nothing, and all of a sudden he gets into power, and he becomes a billionaire? So the problem with our politics is that a lot of people go into politics to become billionaires. A lot of people that were doing nothing. And in turn, they show off this wealth. And they forget that when they show off this world, you're putting pressure on young people that ought to be in school. You're putting pressure on them that they must get rich quick. The other day, there was a video that surfaced of some young stars that, you know, said they, they made a trip to another part because they want to go learn how to be Yahoo boys. They were less than 10 years old. And this thing about I must be rich... Is propelled by a lot of these politicians because of their extravagant lifestyle. So, I think what the National Assembly should do is to declare a state of emergency on the corruption in the National Assembly first, an extravagant lifestyle of these National Assembly members. Because, you see, you might not want to take this point from me, but they are role models to society. Young stars watch them. Youngsters watch some of the influencers that they hang out with and influence them on social media. And that's why I feel we need to sanitize social media. So, it is a state of emergency on the political culture in our country. Ritual killings is just indicative. I mean, can we exonerate National Assembly members from, you know, uh, activities, I should say, of the spiritual spec. Haven't we heard about po politicians going to swear in shrines? I mean, you can also make a case that's, Afri that's Africa traditional religion. But my point is this. It should start from the National Assembly. The National Assembly that is calling for a state of emergency should sanitize themselves and look inwards. Because, you see, youths that are going astray in this country is because we've led them astray collectively. It takes a village to raise a child. So if youths 
are doing ritual killings. That's an indication of the Nigerian village today, the Nigerian country. That's the kind of values and morals we've given to them. And the political class shares a lot. Just like the parents too share a lot. Just like society shares a lot. So it should be a declaration of a state of emergency on Nigerian values. And that's why media comes in strongly because media is very powerful. So we should also reevaluate media and Nigerian values. So it's a declaration of a state of collective emergency on all of us as a group of people. So when the National, Emergen uh, when the National Assembly says, yes, this is a magistrate of ritual killings, I look and say, yet another hypocrisy. What's the tangibility in this? How tangible is it? No, it's not. We should declare a state of emergency collectively on our values, and it should start from the National Assembly. They should sanitize themselves and wade off corruption and do the needful and stop their members flaunting money all around. I mean, there were members that once in the National Assembly uh, that moved on to the Senate that flaunted over how many cars. And when politicians put up pictures and videos like that, Young people too will feel that they have to do untoward uh, on, uh, things to be able to get that. My second story uh, will be about the back and forth going on between uh, President, uh, I say President, uh, Governor Kiridolu and the North and the Northern Elders Forum. Governor Kiri Dulu came out recently to say that if any party that feels the North will not win in 2023, and uh, Hakim Babahatmet, who I've interviewed so many times, replied by saying, these threats will not work. So this is my stand on it. I think it's time to douse these tensions associated with politics. The argument of the Northern Elders Forum has always been Come talk to us, the South, if you want the presidency. But this is the argument of the South. That when it was the turn of the North to become president, nobody came to talk to the South. We just agreed and we understood that, oh, yeah, it was a time for the North. Good luck, Jonathan, and afterwards, and all of that. And they rallied round the North. But I keep Baba Hakmed on many occasions when I speak to him. He keeps making the point that he doesn't like the way the South is going about it. It looks as though they're, you know, they're bullying them and that they are not going to take this. And he's made a couple of, you know, speeches as regards this. If you remember the, one of those speeches he made at our house and said, you know, we're going to fight this to finish. And also, when you look at it, historical antecedents, Akiri Doluto has also said some things about, you know, ban a cow meat based on back and forth as regards fights between the South and the North. Uh, one thing has to be said. Governor Kiri Dolu and the North should calm down. What Nigeria needs is collective peace and development. And we need to talk across board. And I don't think Governor Kiri Dolu should go one step further to say uh, if the North feels a candidate in 20, if anybody feels a candidate in 2023, that they should, that they would lose. Number one, he doesn't know what will happen in 2023. Number two, we don't even know if we're all going to get up to 2023. God owns our lives. And number three, most importantly, everybody, as long as you're Nigerian, every region has a right to field the candidates. And it is incumbent on the people to make a decision. There's a current zeitgeist that power must come to the south. Let the people decide that. But also, in doing all of this, the south too that wants power should be politically savvy. You shouldn't say because oh, there's a zeitgeist, then you shouldn't do your analysis properly. By the way elections are formed, are structured in this country, there's a big slant as regards voting towards the North. Some people argue that that's because of gerrymandering over the years and uh, population too is another big factor that integrity of population numbers that come out of the North. In fact, I've had back and forth with Akim Baba Hakmed as regards this and he keeps on saying, you know, the North is definitely more. And I'm like, okay, yeah, show the numbers. And he's like, oh, we know the numbers. And there was recently about this uh, population uh, census and the NEF, the Northern Elders Forum, was saying, no, 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 this is not the time for population census, that there's a lot of insurgency, that people will not be counted properly, people are displaced and the likes. 
For give or take, you would see historically that the North has always crunched out 12 million votes. President Muhammad Buhari, all the times he ran, you know, always had that threshold. In fact, it, it, was, it was safe to call him the 12 million man. And if the South wants to be president, you'll have to dip into that 12 million. I think rather than saying that if any candidates run from the North, they would lose. I think the Southerners that want power, the conversation should be how can we dip into that 12 million votes? How can we go and reach across the now? Because you see, if the person is going to be the president of Nigeria, the constitution says it's going to get at least two thirds in, in, in about 25 states or thereabout. I don't, I don't remember the exact amount, but that's the analysis about it. And states like Kanu need to come in strong for you. States like Kaduna and some other big voting areas, as well as states like Lagos, as well as states in the East, Anambra and the likes and all of that. So I think rather than all this rhetoric on the newspaper daily, it should be about the South trying to reach across and say, okay, how can we secure the 12 million vote? Because you see, Nigeria political calendar will never change. Those votes out of the North, those 12 million votes, will still determine largely who becomes president in this country. And we've never had neck and neck elections since return to democratic. In fact, even I'll go back to 79 elections because I study elections a lot in this country. In fact, the only first time, based on historical antecedents, we've had sort of like a tie, a hung parliament, was the 59 elections. That was the only time that NCNC won with just a little over 2 million votes. Then MPC, the Northern People's Congress, too, made some big runnings, and they had to form a government of national coalition. But since Return to Democracy in 79, we've never really had so like a, a neck and neck hung parliament race. In fact, even in, even in the 79 polls, I will always talk about, about the technicality of two thirds of 12 states and all of that. There were still some clear margins. So the clear margins will still decide the winner. We've never had a runoff. And if you want those clear margins, you need to win in the North. So I think a lot of people in the South, once they make their declaration, should be how to court the North so we can build a stronger and a more sustainable nation. I think that should be the argument on the table. The third story I'd like to take is the Hizba police banning over 3 million bottles of uh, beer. So uh, there's a part for religion. There's a part for what the Hizba police represents. But there's also a part not to destroy economic activities. If we do a cost analysis of the bottles of beer damaged and the economic impact, you'll be shocked. Over 3 million bottles of beer. Let's say at the rate of one bottle of beer sold for, I don't know how much a bottle of beer now, five, 600 naira or 400 naira times 3 million. You can do the maths. Then you damage this that could have provided jobs for people that are lifting this beer for people that are selling this beer and these jobs are their livelihoods you just destroyed and in turn when they share the vat that they accrue from these companies that produces beer you still take it to develop canoe states i don't get the analogy and that's why i'm excited that the case about vat is in court we'd like to see how the court plays out in vat but you see, to a large extent, and I can't speak about it because the case is in court, we need to look closely or else we might be damaging ourselves. People might have religious sensitivity, but also think about the economic value we're losing for 3 million bottles of beer being damaged. Think about how many people that might have been they might have been employed on the value chain. The last numbers we had are 33% unemployment rates. Some people say those numbers are close to 50% unemployment rate. If you add underemployment to it, I look at the economic viability that has been damaged because you are rejecting bottles and destroying them. I mean, even if you're going to seize them and you don't want them, they could be reallocated to other states. But why destroy them? 
Thank you so much for watching this episode of Refi's Roundup. Watch and share. Thank you.